As Brother David mentioned, I'm a firefighter up in Montgomery County. I worked off this morning and I've been up since a little before five, so two goals is to keep your attention and keep myself awake. But as Brother JD said, I don't think that's going to be a problem because uh, I'm nervous. It's been a while. The topic I was assigned was, is are you being fashioned according to this world? And without any outline or anything for Brother David, I went to him and asked, is there a specific scripture that you're wanting this lesson based on? Is, is there any specific points you want hit? And he said, there's a bunch of scriptures you can use, so whichever one you choose is going to be a good one. So I chose Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. That's the first one that came to mind. I'd like to read Romans 12, verses 1 and 2 as we start off the lesson. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So for a few minutes, I would like to dive into this scripture to look at the words of this. As Brother J.D. also said, know the definitions of what we're talking about. And speaking of Brother J.D., he did hit some of my points today. So you're going to hear a repeat, but what he said is we didn't coordinate, so if we both came up with it, probably good to hear it again. So the word beseech in the first verse of chapter 12, Romans. Beseech is a pleading appeal seriously thinking about. This appeal is based on the next couple words, mercies of God. Look at what God has already done for you and for me. We can see a small portion of what God has done for us when we look in Romans chapter 5, starting in verse 8. It reads, But God demonstrates his own love towards us, that in while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. For if we were enemies when we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. We do not deserve this eternal life, but our gracious and loving God has offered it to us anyway. God's mercies are the basis for our response to his will. It also says in that verse that we present our bodies. A once for all time presence presentation of our bodies to be placed at the disposal of God. We present, present all of our faculties, our whole being. We can see this demonstrated in Isaiah 6 and verse 8 when he said, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And whom will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. He was willing to do whatever God wanted him to do. He wanted to be that servant for God, to use his whole body. The Old Testament, we look back to that, they gave dead sacrifices. The New Testament presents living sacrifices. In that sacrifice, we have to die to sin, but we are to live to Christ. Every single day, giving our bodies that living sacrifice. We are to do this to be acceptable to God, a phrase that's also in that passage, in accordance to what he says, the way he says it, and for the reason he says is to be done, which is our reasonable service. A service that you can think about, you can understand what is good and right, and then do it. Thus, our service is based on the word of God. And only from it do we know what is good and right. Once we realize what God has for us and what he wants from us, then the only reasonable thing for a man to do is to follow it. And if we choose not to follow it and to reject it, that's foolishness on our part. We see this in Psalms chapter 14 and verse 1. <clears throat> so we go to the second verse of Romans chapter 2. Be not conformed. Do not let the world squeeze you into a mold. This was pretty much the whole basis, or a little bit of, Brother J.D.'s lesson. 
the influence that we have and the influence the world has on us. The world should not be our pattern. We must reduce its influence on us and reject its standards. 1 Peter 4 and verse 1 through 4 says, Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself also with the same mind. For he who suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of Gentiles, when we walked in lewdness, lusts, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In regard to these, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of of dissipation, speaking evil of you. That's how the world lives. Let me drop down to verse 3 of Romans 12. Therefore, I make it known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus a curse, and no one will say to that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. The world will think you're strange. We must deny those things, ungodliness and worldliness. We are not to allow ourselves to become unclean. 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 17. And then 7 and verse 1. Therefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. We are to be transformed. This is a metamorphosis. The old world self is changed into the image of Christ. We hold up the pattern of Jesus' life and fashion ourselves in the same image. We are to die to the old way of living and being transformed no longer walk in those sins. Likewise, it was said of the Corinthians, such were some of you. They used to be involved in those things, but he said, ye are washed, ye are sanctified, and ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God, 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 11. Those who are already Christians have made this decision, not to walk like the world, but to walk as Christ. To be a Christian is to be Christ-like. Once one hears and understands and obeys the word of God, or once they hear and understand it, they will either obey it, accept it, or reject it. But those that reject God's word will be without excuse. Romans 1 verse 21, 20 and 21 says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen and being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they that are without excuse... Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were they thankful, and became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish hearts were darkened. <clears throat> we're told to be the light of the world. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16, it reads, Ye are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do a man light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That is our Christian influence. It would be foolish to have a flashlight, but to cover the end of it. You would be taking away the purpose of a flashlight. He says, Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel but in its proper place, the candlestick, so it can give light to the whole house. We worked a fire two days ago, or I guess it's a day now. It's 2 a.m., so my time, time line is messed up a little bit. But we went into that house. I was the first on the nozzle. We opened the door and went in, pitch black. Couldn't see anything in front of me. As firefighters, we have little lights on our coat, so I turned the light on, and I was able to see at least a little bit in front of me until more light was brought into the situation. As Christians, we are told that we are to be that light in this world of darkness around us, that we can bring many souls to Christ. We are to live in the world, but not be of the world. I've heard it said for most of my life that this is like a boat. This boat is made for water, 
but there's not supposed to be water in the boat. This doesn't mean that we should seclude ourselves from the world, because some may think, well, if I'm not supposed to be of the world, then I'm just going to live by myself, to myself, and not have to worry about any of that. But that would be the opposite of what we're supposed to do. That would be defeating the purpose of a Christian. That is like putting a boat in storage and never using it. You're defeating the purpose of owning a boat. If we were to seclude ourselves, how would we propose fulfill the purpose of leading others to Christ? Matthew 28, verse 19 says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And Romans 14, verse 7 also tells us, For no man, for none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. So let's look at some examples in the Bible, starting off with people that refuse to be fashioned according to this world. Our first example I'd like to look at is Joseph. And we find the account of him in Genesis verse, or chapter 29, and we'll read a couple verses there. In Genesis 39, starting in verse 1, it says, And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, brought him out of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down. And then go down to verse 5. And it came to pass, from the time that he had made him overseer in his house, and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand. And he knew not aught he had, save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a godly person and well-favored, a goodly person and well-favored. And it came to pass that after these things, that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph. And she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wadeth not what is with me in his house. And he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in his house than I. Neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great weaknesses, wickness, wickedness, wickedness, I'll get it out in a second, and sin against God? And it came to pass, as she spake to Joseph day by day, that he hearkened not unto her to lie with her or to be with her. And it came to pass about the time that Joseph went to the house to do his business, there was none of the men of the house there within. And she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled out, fled and got him out. And it came to pass when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and was fled forth. Joseph decided not to be fashioned according to this world. He decided to refuse the sexual immorality that he could have very well taken part in. And most people today probably would have. Our next example is Joshua. We see Joshua in chapter 24, verses 14 through 16. He says, Now therefore fear the Lord, and serve him in sincerity and in truth, and to put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood, and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served, which are on the other side of the flood, or the God of the Amorites, in whose land ye dwell. But for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And the people answered and said, God forbid that we shall forsake the Lord to serve other gods. Joshua refused to be fashioned according to this world in serving anyone but the one and only true God. And the people he was addressing chose to do the same. We also see another example, and that's Daniel. Daniel gives us many examples in his life where he chose not to be fashioned according to the world. One of those is he refused to eat the king's meat. The other is he kept praying when it was de declared law not to pray to anyone other than the king at the time. And we can see this 
in Daniel 6, verses 4 through 10. Then the presidents and the princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find none occasion nor fault. For as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. Then said these men, We shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Then these presidents and princes assembled together to the king and said thus unto him, King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes, the counselors and the captains, have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree. And whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for thirty days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing, that it, that it be not changed, according to the laws of the Medes and the Persians, which altereth not. Wherefore, King Darius signed and the writing and the decree. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went to his house. And his window being open in his chambers toward Jerusalem, he knelt upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, and he did as he did aforetime. This wasn't something new that Daniel decided to do just because the law was put in. This is something he's already been doing. And the people of his time realized that. And they realized that was the only way they were going to find any fault in him. So they made the decree, and Daniel didn't care. Daniel went back home and continued as he's always done and kept praying. He decided not to conform to the world. And we see it cost him being put in the lion's den, but God ended up saving him. Let's now look at some examples of people in the Bible who chose to be fashioned according to the world. We read of David in 2 Samuel chapter 11. We're not going to read that whole account. This is the account of David and Bathsheba. David decided to be fashioned according to the world in sexual sins and in murder. But thankfully, when you follow the life of David, we see that he repented of those things. But it took Naaman being sent unto him by the Lord in 2 Samuel chapter 12. When he said, Thou art the man, after the conclusion of this whole lesson he taught him, he said, Thou art the man. We also see a couple we find the account in Acts chapter 5, named Ananias and Sapphira. And in Acts chapter 5, starting in verse 1, it says, But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession, and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? And keep back part of the price of the land. While it remains, was it not thine own? And after thou sold it, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. And great fear came on all those that heard these things. And the young men arose, wound him up, and carried him out, and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after, when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. And Peter answered and said to her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yea, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold the feet of them which were buried, which buried thy husband, are at the door, and shall carry thee out. Then she fell down straightway at his feet, and yielded up the ghosts. And the young man came in, found her dead, and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. And great fear came upon the church, and upon as many as heard these things. And Ananias and Sapphira decided together that they were going to lie. But they didn't have to. Now, I don't know how much they sold the land for, but let's say they sold the land for $10,000. They decided to keep back, let's say, $2,000 and give the rest of the 8000 to the apostles. 
But they decided to tell the apostles they only sold it for 8000 and then secretly kept 2000 Peter said, why was not now in the hand? Was it not thine? It's not about the money, the a price that they gave. It was the fact that they lied and said, that is all that we sold the land for. So they decided to be conformed to this world in line. Aaron also is a bad example or example of also being fashioned according to the world. Aaron fashioned the calf because that's what the people wanted. In Exodus chapter 32, starting in verse 1, it says, And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, and the people gathered themselves together into Aaron, and said to him, Up, make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what, it, what is become of him. And Aaron said to them, Break off the golden earrings, which are in your ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings, which were in the ears, and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand, and fashioned it with a graving tool. After he had made it a molten calf, they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is the feast of the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offering and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Aaron decided to be conformed to this world, to give in to what the people wanted. They wanted another God, so without hesitation, he told them, Give me the gold and I'll make you a God, this golden offering. We also see someone else who, who decided to conform to the way of the world. And that's Judas. In Matthew chapter 26, verses 14 through 16, then one of the twelve said to Judas, then one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priests, and said to them, What will you give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And they covenanted that with him for thirty pieces of silver. And from that time he saw opportunity to betray him. Judas, who was with Jesus, one of the twelve, seeing all the miracles that Jesus did was beside him these days in, days out, decided that money was better and that he would betray Jesus for that money. So then we ask ourselves, what does this mean for the Christian not to live like the world? The Christian life is one of restraint, instead of indulgence. Paul said, abstain from every form of evil. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 22. This does not leave out anything that is wrong. The children of God must deny themselves the common tastes and practices of this world. In James 1 and verse 27, it says, pure religion and undefiled before God. And the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. It's not always going to be easy. At times, it's rather difficult to stand for the truth. And in America, it seems to be getting harder, and the world over. People are social creatures, each and every one of us. Some people don't like socializing, some people are more introverted, but as a whole, we are social creatures, and we enjoy recreation. Jesus even recognized that recreation, wholesome recreation, is helpful. Mark 6, verses 31 through 32. But when we look at our recreation, it should pass a number of tests, and this is just going to be a few that we can look at when looking at what we choose for recreation. First and most simple is, is it a work of the flesh? And to find this out, we can look at Galatians 5, verses 19 to 21. There are listed the works of the flesh, and I'm not going to take time right now to read that. But on your own, look at Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Anything classified as a work of the flesh is wrong for anyone at any point, time, or place. Another question we can ask is, does it interfere with my spiritual growth? Anything that we do 
that will hinder our spiritual growth is wrong. 1 Peter 2, verses 1 through 2. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and all hypocrisy and envyings and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. Another question we can ask is, does it weaken my influence as a Christian? I think Brother J.D. did a very good job at going over that. We must not give great occasion to the enemies of Jehovah to blaspheme, as did David in 2 Samuel 12 and verse 14. Instead, we should bear all things, that we may cause no hindrance to the gospel of Christ, 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 12. Another question we can ask when looking at recreation is, can Jesus walk with me as I do this? Jesus said, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world, Matthew 28, 20. Whenever you're doing your recreation, would Jesus be okay with it if he was sitting next to you? Would he partake in that recreation with you? Sin is what separates us from God. Isaiah 59.2 If Jesus cannot go with us, then we better not go ourselves. When we go into a new society, we watch what other people do, and then we imitate it. Why? Because we want to fit in. The problem is that the standard is the people. People use their selves as the standard. In Jeremiah 10 and verse 23, it says, O Lord, I know that the ways of men is not in himself. It is not in men that walketh to direct his steps. People make mistakes. People sin. Romans 12 verses 1 and 2, back to our original scripture. Christians are not to pattern their lives to conform with the world. Well, what will this result in if we decide to not be conformed to the world but to be transformed as a Christian. Well, one of the things is going to be hatred of the world. Jesus said the world hated him first. People will look at you weird for following Jesus. People already look at me a little weird, so this gives them a little more reason, I guess. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 4 through 6 says, Wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of rioting, speaking evil of you, Shall ye give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? For this cause was the gospel preached also unto them that are dead, that they might be judged according to the men in the flesh, but living according to God in the Spirit. John chapter 15 verses 18 through 19 tells us we have been chosen out of the world, and so the world naturally does not like us. John 17 and verse 9, and again John 15 and verse 8. It is not leaving the world, but leaving the evil of the world. It is tempting to escape the criticism or persecution by appearing to be like everyone else. This is something we can all fall into and something we must guard ourselves against. But Jesus wants us to be different. Not for the sake of just being different, being contrary to everyone else, but to hold on to what is right. The church is to be called out of the world, like that boat. It's supposed to be in the world, but not of the world, like the boat is in the water, but not water in the boat. 1 Peter 2, 9 tells us we're called out of darkness. In an eagerness to increase their numbers, many denominational churches have accommodated themselves to the unbelieving world. The latest fad is to survey the region and to find out what people want in the church and to implement it. For years, I've heard people talking about when they go find a new quote-unquote church to go to. They have this list of what they want in a church, but I have yet to hear anyone say, I want it to be a Bible-believing church. I want them to teach from the church or from the Bible it's usually, well, do they have fun for the children or do they have something that's going to entertain me in this me, me, me generation? But most of them are not concerned about what they're teaching or what the Bible is being taught in the church. 
Entertainment is considered a must for young people. If you look on any of these websites, they usually have videos of some of the services, and it's just a full-blown rock concert. It's entertainment at its finest. The health and wealth message may attract numbers, but it won't save souls. The other problem is people are looking for an easy faith. But true faith isn't always easy. Mark chapter 10 and verse 17 starting reads, And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and knelt down to him and asked, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these things I have observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him, and said unto him, One thing thou lackest. Go thy way, sell whatever thou hast, and give it to the poor. And thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up thy cross, and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved for he had great possessions. Why did Jesus insist something so hard to do to this man? Well, it tells us in the scriptures, because he loved him. He loved him so much that he wanted him to be converted. But Jesus, being all-knowing, knew the heart of this man and knew there was something holding him back. It was his love for earthly riches. We know that opposition strengthens us. As a firefighter, I've learned that you have to be in excellent shape to be a firefighter. I used to weight lift and do all this training, but nothing like what I've had to do since joining the fire department. And I've learned I'm extremely out of shape. So one of the things I've had to work on is my endurance. And to do that, you have to do the hard things and keep going. It's not fun, or at least not always. How do you get physically stronger? You run against the tendency to stay still. You lift weights against their tendency to remain on the ground. Opposition by the world to the church and truth may be rough, but the end result is strength. The apostles led the way when they refused to bow to the pressure to stop preaching. In Acts chapter 5, verses 27 through 29, it reads, And when they were brought when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not straightly command you that ye should not teach in his name, in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Do you think it will reach this point in America? I presented a short topic last Wednesday night for our uh, Wednesday night devotional. What are you willing to die for? And I posed that question, would you be willing to die for Christ? For those who know their Bible know Revelation 2.10 says we are to be faithful unto death. This is not until you die, this is unto. Up until the point of you giving your life, would you die? People we were being put to death back in the times of the Bible was being written for being Christians. And we see Paul was one of those that was leading that up before he, or Saul before he was converted and turned his name to Paul. People are still being put to death today for being Christians. I know we may have it nice here in America for now, but you go to other countries, it's not the same. You declare Jesus is to be your savior and you tell people that you are your, your Christian openly and publicly, you will be put to death. We see even back in, in the time the Bible was written that the church was run out of town. In Acts chapter 8, verse is 1 and following, it says, And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at the time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentations over him. As for Saul... He made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hauling men and women 
committed them to prison. Therefore, they were scattered abroad, went everywhere, preaching the word. You notice what they did? Even when they were scattered abroad, they continued preaching. And the more they were persecuted, the stronger they became, and the stronger their faith, and their numbers grew. We have a blessing from Jesus. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 and 12, it says, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So don't be surprised. People are going to see Christians as enemies because Christians oppose sin. John 15, 20, or John 15, rather, in verse 18 through 20, Jesus knew that being a Christian is hard because we don't always fit in. We have to choose God's way over all else. Matthew 6, 25 says, and for, whatsoever, and for whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. The world is full of problems. There is strife, hatred, sin, evil, injustice throughout life. As Christians, we are not shielded from these things. Instead, we are called to go on despite these things. Luke 9, verse 23, and Matthew 10, verse 38 reads, And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. We've looked at a couple examples of individuals who made their choice to be fashioned like the world. We also looked at those who chose not to be fashioned according to the world. So let us follow the examples of men like Joseph, Joshua, and Daniel, who chose not to be fashioned like the world. But we are humans, and we will sin. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned. So if we found ourselves being fashioned to this world, we hope that we have a tender heart like David did when he realized he had sinned. If you want to realize, if you want to see how David felt about himself after he had been told he had sinned, he realized that what he had done, read Psalms 51. And that's his prayer to God to forgive him. So in conclusion, I ask, are you being fashioned according to this world are you being conformed or are you being transformed? Thank you for your time and attention.